Welcome to the Open3D Engine YouTube channel. I'm Alex Demarjan, a technical trainer with the AWS Game Tech team. Are you interested in learning a little bit more about networked applications? Well, networked applications and games may provide an exciting avenue to bring users together. And in this video, I'll be interviewing Carl Berg, a principal networking engineer on the AWS Game Tech team. He will discuss some of the exciting networking features coming to O3DE, as well as provide some important background information on different networking constructs. Now, one last point before we begin, and this is in consideration for the open source nature of O3DE. The O3D community is constantly making important updates. So make sure to check the description below for any updated content or videos. Hi, Carl. Can you tell us a little bit about yourself? Hi, I'm uh, Carl Berg. I'm one of the principal engineers at Amazon working on O3DE. Uh, my background is primarily physics and networking. Uh, so since joining the O3DE project, I've been working on bringing its math library up to speed, uh, making sure it, it works functionally well across both uh, x86 and ARM targets, uh, getting the SIMD layer working nicely, uh, improving a lot of the core infrastructure. So that includes eventing and uh, notifications and, and interfaces, uh, as well as the console for, for just like runtime debugging operations. Uh, and more recently, I've been working on the, the multiplier functionality, trying to bring that up to a AAA standard. So what are some of the primary considerations when writing the new O3DE networking layer? We really wanted something that was simple uh, and fast and efficient. Uh, so we focused on having a very small code size uh, and very reduced complexity. Uh, it was important for us that we have uh, very low latency on packet send and receive operations as well as low overall, low overall message processing overhead, um, especially like any sort of head of line blocking or ordering constraints that the transport layer might impose uh, upon the application traffic, because uh, that has a very negative impact on, on latency. Uh, we also wanted to go fully server authoritative uh, with uh, local prediction and backward reconciliation on the server, that's for anti-cheat. Uh, we supported the two major forms of, uh, of uh, entity-based networking. So we have network properties uh, and we have remote procedure calls as well. Uh, and we've done reasonably well. The overall solution is pretty performant uh, and it supports all the modern, modern multiplayer features that we need. You mentioned latency a couple times. Why is latency such a concern with multiplayer games? So out of all of the components of a network connection, uh, you have your bandwidth, you have the variance. So like how much, uh, how much variance in your in your uh, latency you, you might have, uh, latency itself, jitter. Uh, latency is the only metric that's up against sort of the hard physical limits of the universe. Uh, and we have good data for this going back about 20 years. So for the most part, uh, the backbone of the internet now is all uh, optical fiber, uh, and you can uh, compute the speed of light over optical fiber by using its index of refraction. It's about 1.5, so the speed of light is about two thirds uh, speed of light in a vacuum. Uh, and just for a baseline, you could take two cities, let's say Seattle and New York, since they're pretty far apart. Uh, that's about 4,000 kilometers, uh, 3,897 exactly. Uh, and the speed of light uh, over optical fiber is about 200,000 kilometers a second. Uh, so if you just divide those out, you get about 20 milliseconds uh, for a, a one-way trip uh, between those two cities. Uh, and so 40 milliseconds for the whole round trip. Uh, and we need the round trip time because uh, you need time for anything you send out to the server to come back. Uh, it's really essential. We always compute full round trip time. Uh, so if we actually run a ping between those two cities, you'll find that it's about 80 milliseconds right now uh, if you're on a pretty good connection, uh, which is a factor of two within the theoretical max we could possibly ever achieve. Uh, and that's really good. Uh, that's, that means we're doing a very effective job of, of routing network traffic. Uh, but the problem is the actual latency has been about 80 milliseconds for close to two decades now. Uh, so we've really hit the limits here. Uh, so basically, once you're stuck with any latency in your, in your overall experience, you're, you, you can't get rid of it. There's nothing you can do. You can't string more fiber. There's really nothing uh, you can possibly do to, to remove that latency. Uh, and for uh, experiences like games that are highly interactive, uh, where you're, you're performing things, doing, doing stuff with controls and, and watching the outputs on your screen, uh, the input latency is very important to the overall play experience. Uh, high input latency is quite frustrating. So what's the difference between client authoritative and server authoritative gameplay? 
It's a good question. So client authoritative gameplay is where you basically allow the client to run its own uh, local simulation of the game and basically tell the server or the other clients uh, what the results of its simulation were. So uh, imagine just a first person shooter. You have a bunch of players running around under a client authoritative model. Uh, each client would be running its own local simulation and, and saying like, hey, I, I shot this guy. And you'd actually be telling the server, hey, I shot this guy, or you know, I, I shot this other player. Uh, and the server would have to run basic checks to make sure like line of sight is is okay, like does it make sense that these play people could can actually uh, interact. Uh, but beyond that, it's really playing a cat and mouse game. Uh, you really need to trust the clients uh, quite, a, quite a great deal in order to do a client authoritative model. Uh, server authoritative, on the other hand, kind of inverts all of that. So the server runs all of the game simulation and it tells the clients what happens. The client is basically just a terminal now. So you collect the inputs on the client, uh, you send that up to the server, the server does all the processing, and then the client gets the results and just renders that result. Uh, and this is really important because, uh, especially for free-to-play titles and um, esports, uh, cheating and hacking can be very devastating to those communities uh, and even the monetization of the, the, of the project in, in total. Uh, so like a, a client authoritative uh, game, it's really easy for a client to modify the local client uh, and then run around at super super high speeds or, you know, headshot everyone in the game. And then uh, for, for server authoritative, all of those hacks are kind of just eliminated. It's not possible anymore under that model. So what is local prediction and why is it so important to O3DE? So as mentioned earlier, input latency is really a terrible thing for games. Uh, you can imagine running a game at, let's say, uh, 10 FPS. Uh, you probably have experience with that. So if, at running 10 FPS, you're basically simulating about 100 milliseconds of input latency. Uh, and for a first-person shooter, let's say, as, you, as you're moving your mouse around, with 100 milliseconds of latency, you tend to overshoot and go past your target. And then you're, you're pulling the mouse back, trying to, trying to drag it back down into the right position. And then you overshoot again, and you end up with this sort of oscillating behavior over where you actually want to be. Uh, and that's very frustrating, especially for a, a fast-paced game. Uh, so that, that can easily make a game unfun. Uh, and so because with server authoritative uh, gameplay, you need to wait the full round trip. You know, the, the client uh, samples its inputs, it sends it up to the server, server executes and sends the results down. That's a full round trip time for any results of your inputs to, to show up on your screen. Uh, so, you know, the, the Seattle to New York example is 80 milliseconds, but really that could get about as well, about 400 milliseconds in practice if you're playing between like Seattle and somewhere in Australia, for example. So local prediction, uh, what that allows us to do is it lets us basically simulate the results of your inputs immediately on the client. You don't have to rip, wait that full round trip time anymore uh, just to see what happens. Uh, it's totally an illusion. Uh, we're, we don't actually have any authority on the client. Uh, we just pretend that we do to actually run all those inputs. Uh, but if there's any kind of a disagreement between the client and the server, the server wins. The server will correct the client. Uh, there's quite a bit of complexity to making all of this work. Uh, it means the networking model needs to have semi-deterministic input processing, uh, for example. Uh, we need a mechanism for detecting and correcting uh, any sort of desyncs between a client and a server. Uh, we need a way to replay any outstanding inputs uh, between a correction event and, and where the client is now. Uh, and we also need a mechanism to basically rewind the, the state of the world on the server uh, because, uh, you know, the, the desyncs between uh, the various in, uh, data between the client and the server uh, make it very important that uh, for any input to replay correctly on the server when it when it's authoritatively processing, it means we need to definitely get the, the state of the world correct as it was on the client when they're performing the input pr predictively. Excellent. Can you explain a little bit more about network properties and remote procedure calls? And why would I use one over the other? So those are our two major forms of uh, network communication in O3DE inside our multiplayer gem. Uh, and they have very distinct characteristics. Um, so you can think of uh, network properties as more like the class state or the member data if you're more of an object-oriented programmer. Uh, so it's really this, this um, thing where you write to these properties and then you know you, that gets replicated over to a remote endpoint and you can read from them. Uh, and there's a venting setup so you can basically register and say, I want to get notified if, if a property on some uh, network network entity changes, uh, and the whole network property system uses uh, eventually consistent delta replication, uh, so it's quite efficient. Uh, in fact, it uses uh, the algorithm, algorithm populated by uh, ID Tech, uh, 
which is really quite clever. So it's fully unordered, unreliable, uh, and there's no ordering constraints on it. So any packet reordering or, or packet loss doesn't affect the, the latency of getting the latest state in the client. Uh, for the remote procedure calls, on the other hand, that's much more like messaging or events. Uh, so function calls on the class, you can think of it like that. Uh, and just by its very nature, uh, it's quite a bit more expensive than network properties for, for transmitting state. Uh, so for example, there's no delta replication on, on network pro on RPCs because, I mean, there's no base that you would uh, delta compress against in this case. Uh, as well, we don't really have ordering constraints on the remote procedure calls, which might be a bit unusual for some. Uh, because we didn't want the, the networking layer to be making determinations about like what was usable by the application. Uh, really, we wanted to dispatch everything to the application layer as fast as possible and let the application decide uh, whether ordering should be enforced. Uh, and really, this is all about getting that lowest possible latency uh, for, the, for the end user to, to get the best customer experience. Thank you, Carl, for taking time to speak with us. In this video, Carl provided a brief overview of some networking constructs and how they relate to O3DD. Stay tuned for future videos where we'll discuss more O3D related content. Thanks for watching, and we'll see you in the next video.